Hello, I'm Paul Thompson. I teach the Ethics in Animals course at Michigan State University nearby, and uh, I have I the curious pleasure of introducing someone who I'm sure needs uh, less introduction to this group than I would. Um, Mark Beckoff is Professor Emeritus of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Colorado Boulder. He's a fellow of the Animal Behavior Society and a past Guggenheim fellow. In 2000, he was awarded the Exemplar Award from the Animal Behavior Society for his long-term contributions to the field of animal behavior. Uh, I first met Mark when I was on the faculty at uh, Texas A&M University, I think probably longer ago than either of us would uh, really care to admit when he was, uh, this was probably a, about a quarter of a century ago when uh, he was there uh, collaborating with Colin Allen on uh, what came to be, I think, some uh, foundational work both for the study of animal behavior but especially for philosophical work on uh, how we think about animals from a scientific perspective uh, and also how we think about uh, their experience from a, a scientific perspective. I've uh, used uh, the book that he did uh, with Jessica Pierce, Wild Justice, numerous times in my class. Uh, and I noticed that uh, he and Jessica have a new book out, which I haven't read, The Animal's Agenda, Freedom, Compassion, and Coexistence in the Human Age. And I noticed also that it's uh, quite similar to the title of his talk today, in which he'll uh, share how people who claim to work on behalf of non-human animals rely on the science of animal welfare guidance um, as to what types of treatment are permissible. However, animal welfare science while offsetting some of the worst aspects of animal suffering, falls short of promoting true animal well-being and freedom with a focus on individual animals. So without further delay, Mark Beckoff. Thank you, Paul. That Thanks. In 25 years. I, I yeah? Good. Well, those are hard acts to follow. And some of what I was going to say has already been said, so I may skip through a few things. But first, um, I'm really glad to be here. I'm, I'm actually honored to address all of you. I may be coming to things from a different point of view, but really, I think to me, the bottom line is we work for the animals, not against one another. We can have radical disagreements, which we do, and that's OK. That's just life. So anyway, thank you for being here. Um, Really, some of, the, some of the things I wanted to say have been said, and I'll try to keep on time. I don't do a PowerPoint, so you're going to have to listen to me, and I'm going to have to figure out what I wrote here. Um, so up front, I would just want to say the animal's agenda should be our agenda to take care of them and give them the very best lives possible while respecting who they are, not what they are. And, and really what they want to do is live in peace and safety just like we do. Um, I hear the phrase, you know, giving them <coughs> a better life or the best life, but, but we need to recognize that a better or, quote, the best life we can give them isn't necessarily a good life. It's just the best we can do for them in the conditions under which we decide we want to keep them. Um, I think ethics with a capital E is really crucial to bring into um, the discussion. We have a lot of really good biologists and psychologists and just a whole array of people from different um, fields who are interested in um, animal welfare or what Jessica and I call animal well-being. So just a couple of things <clears throat> that I'm going to come back to. I think it's great and it's really important to talk about compassion for other animals. I know some people think it's kind of fluffy to talk about compassion and sentiment and heart, but I think we really need to do that and bring that into the discussions. So I think we need a revolution of heart uh, to start with. Um, I think it's important, too, um, to recognize that good people do bad things to other animals and do bad things in the world. I've taught a course in the Boulder County Jail for 15 years on animal behavior and conservation, and I actually use a lot of principles of animal behavior and of conservation to help these guys get through. They range from pickpockets to serial murderers. And people can argue that they're bad people, and frankly, some of them have backgrounds that if I had the same background, I would have done exactly what they did to survive in 
the world. So I think it's really important that we should be criticizing, sometimes people use the word attacking, positions, not people. It just doesn't get us anywhere to um, demean other people. Um, I look at zoos as a great example, there's many others of course, of human domination of nature and the world at large. And you know, the major problem, and I know a lot of people don't like to talk about it, is it's just too many of us. I mean, you know, I mean, you, we, we don't need to go into a song and dance about this, but um, there's just too many of us and we are taking over the world. So I'm gonna start with a quote <coughs> that many of you may know brings out a lot of points I want to make in this talk from Henry Reston from his book, um, The Atomost House. So he writes, we need another and a wiser and perhaps a more mystical concept of animals. We remote from universal nature and living by complicated artifice, man in civilization surveys the creature through the glass of his knowledge and sees thereby a feather magnified and the whole image in distortion. We patronize them for their incompleteness, for their tragic fate, for having taken form so far below us, below ourselves. And therein do we err, for the animal shall not be measured by man. In a world older and more complete than ours, they move finished and complete, gifted with the extension of the senses we have lost or never attained, living by voices we shall never hear. They are not brethren, they are not underlings, they are other nations caught with ourselves in the net of life and time, fellow prisoners of the splendor and travail of the earth. So there's lots of gems in this quote, in, um, and I'll just name a few and develop some more. Ron and other people before me have already spoken about some of them. <coughs> First is we do patronize non-human animals, and animal welfare does patronize other animals in the name of humans. We don't like to look at it that way, but one of the assumptions of a lot of what we're gonna talk about um, today and we talk about all the time is that it's okay to keep animals in cages. It's okay to keep animals in captivity. It's okay to use non-human animals in the name of human animals. And I think we really, really need to, um, we really need to discuss that a lot. Non-humans are not incomplete. They're who they are. We're not the template against whom we should compare other animals. They do a lot of things we can't do. We do a lot of things they can't do. I don't know any non-human animal who stresses about taxes or whether their cell phone battery runs out. Maybe they do, but, um, but you know, we just need to look at why they've evolved in the situations they've evolved and how they adapt to their world. As a biologist, that's really, to me, the basic question. And they're not below us or less than us. I mean, that's just ridiculous to say that. Um, below, <coughs> excuse me, it's dry here, except it's wet. <laughs> um, they're not below us um, because the word below translates into less valuable or disposable. They're not, and we're not above them. We're not necessarily more valuable. And <clears throat> when I get, come to discussion of the science of animal well-being, what we're talking about is the value of each and every individual. And I know that there are some people who practice animal welfare who are concerned with individual animals. But in the end, like I said before, the assumption is that it's okay to use other animals in the name of humans. And I think we really need to delve into that a bit more. So here's another quote from a horribly confused and very confusing and ill-informed essay called Bambi or Bessie, Are Wild Animals Happier? So she starts off, what we do know so far is that evidence suggests wild animals can be as happy in captivity as they are in nature, assuming they are treated well. Confinement alone doesn't mean an animal is automatically worse off. If we give an animal all the good things they would have in the wild, food and water, fellow members of their species a certain amount of space, and take away that, stresses, that which stresses or hurts them, predators, parasites, extreme weather, then it can live it, notice, can live just as happily in an enclosure. Zoo animals with proper care and enrichment, for example, have similar hormone profiles, live longer, eat better, and are healthier than their wild counterparts. Why? Because life in the wild is hard, in captivity it's easy. I mean, published in Scientific American. 
No, seriously, when I read that, it really made me sick. First of all, we're here because we know life in captivity isn't easy, right? I mean, zoos put a lot of effort into enrichment programs. I mean, we're here today because we know that it's not easy and that we need to do better for the animals who we choose to keep in captivity, okay? I mean, to me, it's just ridiculous to make that claim, but she did, and that's why we're here, okay? Um, so, I know there'll be discussions on what it means to be captive, but it's really clear that um, captivity imposes all sorts of extreme constraints on the freedoms of other animals. And I, I use the word freedom, not freedom, freedoms, because really what we want to see is, or what we want to achieve is to allow animals, like I said, to be who they are, taking into account biologically who they are, the situations in which they've evolved, the behavior patterns that are important for them to um, express. So we need to accept the fact that other animals, just like human animals, want to be able to mingle socially, roam, roam about, eat, drink, sleep, pee, poop, have sex, make choices, play, relax, and get away from us when they can. And I think that if we look at that as the goals to um, which we aspire, then holding animals in captivity is going to, by definition, is going to compromise and constrain their freedoms. I was going to talk a bit about the five freedoms, but we've already heard that mentioned, and they've been expanded by um, David Meller into what are called the five domains. But once again, when you really look at them, and I think... I go back and forth, quite frankly, whether the five domains is really an improvement on the five freedoms. They're certainly more detailed, and I heard David give one of his typically wonderful talks about the five domains. But once again, <coughs> the assumption is that it's okay to use animals. We're just trying to make their lives better. Um, so in our book, The Animal's Agenda, one of the first things that struck Jessica and me is that the five freedoms as they're traditionally applied, are more about constraints and deprivations than they are about freedoms, okay? So they talk about the freedom for animals to move around, to be fed, to have water. I mean, really, I mean, you talk about basic needs, just food and water, and talking about, you know, whether they need more freedom to move about. So would a chicken rather have 68 square inches of living space or 72 square inches? Um, would an elephant rather have one acre or three acres? in which to roam, okay? I mean, to me, some of these moves are what I would call feel-good moves because they make you feel better, but they don't really get you much, okay? Three acres for an elephant isn't really enough. And I always use the example that Ron talked about of the Detroit Zoo and other zoos getting rid of their elephant exhibits and actually showing increases in attendance. So not to worry whether you're losing um, animals who are lucrative. I want to make a few comments about what I call, or who I call, poster individuals. I guess on the downside, they're poster corpses, um, in the sense, Marius the giraffe, Harambe the gorilla, Tilikum, a.k.a. Tilly the orca, Paki the elephant, and most recently, Senja, who is a polar bear at SeaWorld, who died after 20 years, who died after her friend of 20 years named Snowflake was shipped to the Pittsburgh Zoo to make more polar bears destined to live out their lives in cages. A SeaWorld spokesperson claims Senja lived a long and enriching life at SeaWorld. I, I'm, I, I, I don't know what to say about that, okay? She lived a long life. Maybe it was enriching. But the big question that was posed in a lot of essays was why did she die? And people said, well, maybe she died of a heartbreak. I think she could have died of a heartbreak. People suffer from heartbreaks. There's no reason to think that non-human animals don't. And I always think about people who live, I pick dogs, I love cats, other companion animals. You hear stories all the time about dogs missing or losing their best canine, feline, or other friend or human friend. Well, if dogs can do that, why can't a polar bear? So I really think we need to keep that in mind that, and I'll get back to some of the um, aspirational goals of zoos, one of which is stop shipping animals around as if they're breeding machines and unfeeling objects. Senja and Snowflake were good friends. There's no reason to think that Senja didn't miss Snowflake. 
just like my dog Jethro missed his friend Maddie. Okay, so I, I'm just gonna, um, I wanted to raise that issue. Um, we also consider all the hoopla about making more captive pandas who'll spend their entire life in cages. And there was a recent article um, called um, Do Pandas Suffer from Culture Shock? Dealt with um, pandas who were shipped from the Atlanta Zoo back to China. And they, they were unhappy. I mean, they wouldn't feed, they were scared, and somebody cashed this out as being a form of culture shock. And yeah, I go to China. I mean, it, it's, it's a bit of culture shock coming from Boulder, Colorado. But I think what happened was these animals were just ripped apart from a familiar environment, including familiar people. And they didn't like it, just like dogs don't like it. So once again, I think we really need to pay attention to how we are handling these other animals. The one individual who comes to mind is Marius. And I'm sure people in this room have been, I call it, marius out, OK? But for those of you who don't know, he was heartlessly and unnecessarily and unapologetically killed at the Copenhagen Zoo because he didn't fit into the zoo's breeding program. Um, zoos like to use the word or the term management euthanasia to sort of clean it up. You know, I mean, really, when I talk to my friends about management euthanasia, they'll go, yeah, I understand that. The fact is, Marius wasn't euthanized. I could say he was euthanized. He was otherwise healthy. He was killed. Simple. Because he didn't fit into the zoo's breeding program, and there were other options for him to go and live out his life. The only way I can see that the word euthanized could have been used would have been that they were killing him and he wouldn't have to spend the rest of his life in a cage, sticking his tall neck over a cage to get um, fed. That's the only thing that I can think about. So these words like cold and euthanized and um, I, there's others that are used, are, I call them weapons or words of mass distortion because they're just used to clean up and sanitize repugnant and horrific acts of killing otherwise healthy animals, okay? It happens. I don't, I mean, I tried to find the data out for the US and I don't know about that, but there was an article in the BBC News that talked about 6,000 or so animals a year being killed in zoos. We don't really hear about that very much. Um, I was actually surprised. I mean, I was, I was surprised that Marius was killed, and I, I was surprised at the comment of the head of the Copenhagen Zoo, who just said, yeah, well, yeah, we killed him. We dissected him publicly as an educational experience. And then they fed Marius' remains to the, um, the lions, I believe, the carnivores in the zoo. I mean, I find that to be perfectly acceptable. I mean, he was dead. I don't think Marius really cared whether he wound up as a hamburger for lions in the zoo. But the fact of the matter he was, that he was killed in the first place, I think, raises a red flag. So I want to talk about two ideas I have before I wrap up. Um, one comes from um, how compassionate conservation can help rescue us. And there will be a panel, and Dan Ramp is here, with whom I've done a lot of work on this area, in the area of compassionate conservation. So compassionate conservation is it's a rapidly growing international and interdisciplinary field. And to me, it offers a practical and an involved ethic for conservation. And the guiding principles include first do no harm, which is a commitment to prioritizing non-invasive approaches in conservation research and practice, and an acknowledgement that invasive interventions may harm individuals, populations, and ecosystems. <clears throat> more and more scientists are recognizing that highly invasive methods of study and handling animals also compromises data sets. This is this whole field brewing, people wondering why the data that are collected in certain studies don't seem to apply across, say, across the board to members of the same species. Because in many ways, we're studying behavior of stressed animals, territory use, marking animals, putting radio collars on them. I'm not saying that these are all, quote, bad, but if you don't have a baseline data, if you don't have baseline data against which to compare the data that you're collecting, you may be collecting data on the behavior of stressed wolves. I studied, I did field work on coyotes for years. I did field work in Antarctica on Adelie penguins. And by the way, I'd rather be an Adelie penguin in Antarctica, Ron, with all due respects. Okay, they have a tough life, but 
that's how, that's life, that's nature. Um, so first do no harm would be the first commitment, and that would be not harming other animals in, in the name of whatever you want to call it, but it comes down into the name of humans. The second is that individuals matter, and that's what forms the basis of the science of animal well-being to which I'll return, valuing all wildlife and striving for peaceful coexistence. I mean, I know that's... I, I, sometimes when I, I see people roll their eyes when I talk about compassion and peaceful coexistence, they're, they're possible. I mean, it's possible, but we need to do more than we're doing. The other area that I've worked in is I call it personal rewilding. I, kind of, I took the term rewilding from conservation biology where it applies to building corridors for animals to move without, um, without being intruded upon by humans. The, the Yukon to the Yucatan, um, Y to Y corridor is one of the most famous. So I began to think about this and every morning I would take my dog <coughs> on a four or five mile run and we'd talk about life and he would fill me in about what he really wanted as a dog and then all wild animals wanted. And I began to think of personal rewilding as a personal transformation because, because really each of us in this room is an individual. We have a view of the world. We have our own ethical compasses, our moral compasses. What I think is reprehensible, some people might accept or vice versa. That's just the way it is. We're a very complex, complicated, and very interesting big brain mammal, okay? So the fact that we disagree is to, to me, it's a fact we will disagree, but how do we resolve those conflicts? But I think it all starts from within. So I look at rewilding as just a number of phrases, undoing the unwilding from education, undoing the unwilding from the way in which media and zoos and other institutions misrepresent animals. I mean, they, they do. I mean, an elephant in a semi-natural habitat is not an elephant in a natural habitat. So let's just face that, okay? I don't mean that as a, as a criticism. I mean, it just, it's just, it's a fact, okay? We all get trapped in the busyness of the world. Um, and I think that what I find when I talk to people, when I mention about rewilding, what I really mean is acting from the inside out. Once again, people don't like the word heart when you talk about our interactions with other animals. But, but in a sense, we're either acting, we're acting from our heart in some ways, either heartful or heartless. So I see rewilding about nurturing our sense of wonder and curiosity. It's about being nice, kind, compassionate, and empathic, and harnessing our inborn goodness and optimism. There's a lot of research coming out of social psychology and psychology that shows that we're basically innately good individuals, okay? Um, the press doesn't like that because blood sells, but you don't read about all the nice things that people do for other people and non-human animals. You read about all the wars. You read about Donald Trump. Oh, sorry, I, I wasn't going to mention him. I'm sorry, you know. Um, <laughs> but what's that? Oh, um, Let's see. So in the end, what I do is I think of rewilding as an attitude, and I've developed what I call the 10 Ps. I'll just read them, but we could discuss them later. Being proactive, positive, persistent, patient, peaceful, practical, powerful, passionate, playful, and present. And one of the things that I've been dealing with lately, not personally, but I've had people talk to me about compassion and empathy fatigue, and I know there's people in the room who suffer from that. People who work on behalf of human animals, if you will, who are compromised for one reason or another, caregivers, really suffer from the fatigue of constantly giving, constantly putting out and you get something back from doing the nice things, but it doesn't energize you in the same way as other activities might. And so I really think that being playful, and my friend Bruce Gottlieb, who's a psychologist, always says, just getting away from your brain. You know, look at yourself and laugh in the mirror. And just try to make light of certain things that you can make light of, but certainly the way we interact with other animals is not one. So. Reform, and I know Ron really wanted to concentrate on that, and I was thinking of reforming as reshaping and asking for a paradigm shift right now. It ain't going to happen today, 
okay? I'm not that naive, although sometimes I am. But here are some of the things that I would like to see happen. They're aspirational, and, and good intentions are not good enough, okay? I really believe, and I know I get grief from a lot of people that, and I don't know everyone in this room, but I know a lot of you that even though we differ, we do want to do the best we can for the non-human animals who are in our care, Okay, I mean, I really believe that. But we may have different values and different ethical sort of guidelines, but that's okay. So here's a couple of things I'll throw out. And I was looking for the nearest exit to... Oh, there it is. Okay, great. <laughs> no. Stop captive breeding. Stop shipping animals around as breeding machines and breaking up social groups and friendships. And this stops... This means stop, stop playing musical animals, if you will. Um, they're sentient beings who care about what happens to them, their families, and their friends. They're not unfeeling objects. Stop zoothanizing healthy animals. I think this is really important. Um, focus on individual animals. Stop calling zooed animals ambassadors for their species. They're not. Once again, I mean, I mean... <laughs> They're not. I mean, it would be like, I've discussed this in the class I teach in prison, and these guys are not ambassadors for, they're all men, so for males of whatever, you know, different cultures. They're, they're not, okay? Um, why would a, an animal pacing back and forth in a cage be the ambassador for their species? If anything, it, it teaches bad lessons about these animals. I also think we need to come to terms with what zoos do in terms of education and conservation. And what I mean here is how it, how it translates into direct action and other action on behalf of the zooed animals. And I know there's full discussions on this. And, you know, we all know people who say they've gone to the zoo and they've become a biologist. We have all know people who leave the zoo and say, wow, wasn't that amazing what I saw? Um, you know, I never would have been that close to a chimpanzee or an elephant or, in Ron's case, a snail. And what does that really mean? And what does it really mean to make a contribution? I mean, to me, the bottom line is money. I hate to come down to that. But if people leave having this wonderful feeling about chimpanzees or elephants or lions or giraffes or snails, if... Just having that is great. I mean, I'm an academic, and I work with some philosophers who, after a while, they drive me crazy, but I think knowledge for its own sake is good in having these discussions. But if they don't make monetary contributions or do something, then it may be education for education's sake, which is okay, but I don't see where it translates into direct action. So to me, the major question is, do people really change their behavior in any meaningful way or is a feel-good thing, or is it feel-good thing that evaporates over time? Okay, I just want to deal with that. I struggle with conservation. I do. I look at the list that Ron's put up. I've seen other lists, so I struggle with it. Um, sometimes I want to know what percentage of animals in zoos actually are endangered or threatened. Are we really working on behalf? How many minutes? Five minutes. Okay, no problem. What percentage of mammals, birds, etc., are threatened or endangered? What percentage are the money makers? Okay, so I don't, I, I do. I mean, I'm a field biologist, and I want to see wild animals be protected and conserved and preserved, and their habitats, you know, retained for them. Okay, but but I really want to know more about that. I think that I honestly think when I talk to people who are not. They, they may be zoo goers, and they don't. They come to um, views about education and conservation with a real open mind. That the education card fails them, the conservation card doesn't. I, I, that's just my take from a very informal survey of people with whom I talk. Make zoos sanctuaries for the animals. And to me, you know, one of the really big questions. And it's a, th it's a thorny one, that's why we're here. Is it worth the lives of the captive animals to supposedly help their wild relatives and other individuals? I mean, I think we really need to think about that. If somebody came to me and said, 
you know, we need more white guys like you, and we're going to put you in a cage, and you'll be the ambassador for other white guys around the world. I, I don't think I would accept. Uh, maybe I'm not that altruistic <laughs> after all. But I just think that we really, we really need to ponder that question, okay? The other big thing, and it's once again something Jessica and I discover, uh, dis uh, discuss in our book, is that our behavior hasn't caught up with the science. I like to call us homo denialists. We are great at denying things that are right in front of us, okay? So I mentioned this. So, for example, the Federal Animal Welfare Act has been written to exclude lab rats and lab mice as animals. There's a phrase in the Animal Welfare Act that says, we are redefining the word animals to exclude rats of the genus ratus and mice of the genus moose as animals. I mean, when I talk to first graders, I don't know what to tell them. One guy said, well, they're not plants. Well, they're not. But I mean, the science hasn't kept up. Another is, <coughs> in, the, in the United States, national um, wildlife refuges have been open to hunting and fishing. And what's a refuge? I mean, I consider my home a refuge, and I'd like to believe somebody doesn't have the right to come into my house and steal my single malt scotch. Okay, they can take my books, but not my scotch. But, but I really mean this. I mean, we know these animals are sentient beings. We know they have feelings. We know they care about what happens to themselves, their families, and their friends. But yet, all that we're learning is not being incorporated into working for them and on their behalf. So we need to come, get over that knowledge translation gap. And the other reform is, we, Jessica and I call for replacing animal welfare with the science of animal well-being, which basically means the life of every single individual matters. Every single individual matters. We don't play the numbers games and go, well, there's a million brown rats, so it doesn't matter if we kill 10,000 of them, okay? It doesn't work. Because each of those animals who's killed, sometimes in brutal ways, cares and suffers and feels pain, okay? So basically, our conclusion is that welfare science is not science in the service of animals, but really science in the service of what we call the animal industrial complex. There's a lot of money involved in the use of non-human animals across venues, not only in zoos, okay? If we cared about animal welfare, factory farms would be closed yesterday. They just would be. Whether you choose to eat meat or animal products or not, factory farms would, should be closed yesterday. We wouldn't see a lot of the invasive research that's going on, okay? We just wouldn't really see it. So to me, the words welfare and humane are overused. They put humans first, and then we try to accommodate non-humans into sort of the human needs framework. So I'm just going to end now and, and thank you, um, for listening to me. I'm sure you all agree with everything I say. No. Um, but anyway, the one, the one message I want to reiterate, because I'm, I really am honored and I'm flattered to give this talk, and if I'm saying things that upset people, so be it. You'll say things that upset me. That's fine. We can have good conversations. But the one thing I really want to reiterate, and I don't remember which of the previous speakers said um, this, but we all have goals in common and we need to work with one another. And once again, we have finite time and energy, so let's work for the animals, not against other people. Negativity and all that, it's just a waste of time, and none of us has infinite time and energy to do this. So thank you very much.